fast. Remember, the U.S. House of Representatives from the 37th District of California, all the way from Century City to South L.A., member of House Judiciary and House Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. And just recently back from Cuba, where you went with the President of the United States on that historic visit. Uh, tell us about that. First of all, you had been there before, more I often have. than anybody else had uh, <laughs> from the delegation. Uh, what, what was accomplished? Well, I think what was accomplished was the end of a policy that we've had in our country for over five decades. And it's not completely ended, meaning the embargo is not lifted because Congress has to do that. But I think the headway, the forward movement that the president made that culminated in his visit was really remarkable. It was amazing to be there in a historical moment. First president to visit the island in 88 years. And you had been there on plenty of occasions before. Why was this so meaningful specifically for you? Well, one, because I actually always had a problem and a disagreement that I feel as a U.S. citizen I should be able to go anywhere in the world I choose. I didn't like the fact that my government restricted me from going to Cuba. And so uh, an island that's 90 miles away from us that's culturally so similar, uh, I thought it was important to go and very meaningful to go with the president of the United States, as you can imagine. And not just the president, it was the full first family. And the Cuban people were very excited to receive them. Some would say this was a little too early to legitimize an, auto an autocratic government that does not foster basic human rights. Well, if you just think about it, think of who we have relationships with around the world. This island, 11 million people, same number of, of, of citizens as in L.A. County, 90 miles away from us. We should be trying to make friends with them. And if you look at it from the point of view of U.S. business interest, as well as interest in, in our country, period, for us not to communicate with an island that's 90 miles away from us is unacceptable. If we're going to judge leaders who we have relationships with around the world, we wouldn't have relationships with too many countries. Still, though, this is 90 miles away. And yes. some would argue that they have received now diplomatic relations. The embargo is slowly coming down. What's the U.S. getting in return? Well, I think, first of all, we're ending our isolation because one of the problems in our policy with Cuba is that it really isolated us from the rest of Latin America. Latin American countries have been complaining for a long time. This was a sore spot with them. But let me tell you something very specific. The Cubans actually have something to contribute to the United States. I went there a couple of years ago on a congressional delegation with the Diabetes Caucus that we have in Congress because the Cubans have invented a medication that will reduce the need to amputate limbs. And you know, the main reason for foot amputation in the United States is diabetes. They've been able to reduce it by 70%. This is a medication that we need to have in the United States. They've invented a vaccine against lung cancer. We need to have these medications tested and if they prove valuable, they need to be marketed and distributed to the U.S. population. So it's not just a one-way street. When you were there, that's when the Brussels attack, the terrorist attack yes. took place. Yes, yes. Were you satisfied with the administration's response? Well, I woke up in the morning and turned on the news, and it was just such a tragedy. And my heart goes out to all of the victims. It's very frightening. You know, the administration's response I thought was appropriate. I thought it was uh, shameful that it was politicized. So the president was, was criticized for not coming back to Washington, D.C. right away. If he had come back to Washington, D.C., he would have been criticized for politicizing it. So I think he was uh, going to be criticized regardless. When the president travels, especially when he travels with Air Force One, Air Force One is like a flying White House. So I don't believe that uh, his response was problematic at all. But the imagery of him giving an interview at a baseball game, Cuba versus Tampa Bay, while this crisis was unfolding, well, you know, uh, actually, the first interviews happened before then. I mean, the first criticism was that he gave his speech, you know, on the same day. So maybe the optics looked a little strange because he was at a baseball game, but he was being responsive to the crisis that had happened regardless of what setting he was in. Let's move on. We have a few more minutes. One of the priorities you've had in the House is, is criminal justice reform. On Absolutely. Uh, particularly when it comes to women. And yes. And you've gotten some bipartisan support on that. Uh, now, women don't make up much of the prison population, but from what I understand, your argument is is that they've been treated the same as the overwhelming male population when they shouldn't be. 
Well, actually, I think that women are incarcerated for different reasons. And, and in some cases, you know, women, certain sectors of women are, are the fastest growing population in prison. So my concern was, while we were engaging in this bipartisan discussion on criminal justice reform, nobody actually had ta thought about the specific needs that women face. And so, you know, for example, legislation that I was able to uh, incorporate in a larger bill um, outlawed on a federal basis shackling pregnant women. Can you imagine that we did that in our country? We do that, actually. So a woman who is nine months pregnant is getting ready to deliver a baby on the gurney while she's in labor, she's shackled to the gurney. Now, where is a woman going to go? And so we outlawed that in California. We, do ha we did have to do some accompanying legislation, but I think that that was something that was inhumane and needed to go. And so we were able to pass that. Now, the, the legislation is still working its way through, but it did pass out of committee, and the next step will be to hear it on the floor. And in terms of overall criminal justice reform, you've written editorials about mass incarceration. Right. But at the same time, whereas that, ar that argument is being made, You've seen, we've seen a surge of crime in California. Uh, in L.A., the city of L.A., murders are up 25 percent. Uh -huh. This comes at a time where the, the economy is better, right. unemployment has gone down. Can you, you know, square that for us? Well, me? yes. One thing that I, I know does not match, and that is the fact that we've been reducing our prison population, and you cannot make a link between that and the rise in crime. And the reason I say that is because crime is up all over the country, regardless of whether there's been changes in criminal justice policy. One of my big areas of focus is if we are going to now address mass incarceration and let people out of prison, we need to make sure that they reintegrate into society in an appropriate way. Because while we were getting tough on crime and raising and increasing sentences, we also banned people from many occupations when they get out. So if you don't allow a person to integrate into society legally, then you're just encouraging them or really leaving them no alternative but to continue a life of crime. So reentry services and helping people readjust uh, to life is my legislative focus right now. Thank yes. you very much for joining us. You're very Karen welcome. Bass from the 37th <laughs> District. Up next, the MTA wants to raise taxes, a ballot measure in November.